Okay, so um, make a start. Um, so today we're going to do a sensitivity analysis, um, um, which is, uh, I think, the last but one lecture. It's supposed to go, oh, like that. <laughs> okay, so last time we talked about MU kit and uh, how that works. Um, and today we're going to, I mean, talk about something that I think is um, uh, sort of a critical component about any analysis. And in fact, um, I think comes into um, this particular stage, if you've written a simulation and you, you're you even trying to debug the simulation, sensitivity analysis is the sort of thing that you can do on the simulation to try and assess that the simulation is behaving in the way you would expect, because quite a common challenge. And I always remember this, um, uh, talk from Mark Kennedy, who worked with Tony O'Hagan uh, on, and I'm talking like 20 years ago when they were doing this emulation, they had this center uh, doing it at Sheffield. And they were looking at um, models of the carbon cycle. I always remember that um, the talk Mark gave on this model of the carbon cycle uh, was all of the form that they were just doing some basic emulation on this simulation of the carbon cycle, and they were finding a bunch of problems with the simulation. So the, the example that sticks in my head was that they were varying the times at which the leaves fell off trees. You know, so depending on the weather in a given year, you find that sometimes the leaves even fall at the end of August, um, or sometimes they fall later into September. And this has an anticipated effect on the carbon cycle. I can't remember which the direction was in terms of how much carbon is being stored. Uh, and what they were finding is when they varied that, um, it was having the opposite sign effect. Um, and then they found that there was a bug in the simulation. So um, it's really, really hard actually to <laughs> write a simulation and be confident that you've got everything correct. And so sensitivity analysis, I mean, that wasn't quite sensitivity analysis, what they were doing there, what they were doing was um, in, they were using Bayesian quadrature to integrate over all inputs apart from this one. And then they were varying the uh, timing and then seeing the directionality was wrong, if I remember well. There's a, a paper on that, uh, that exact problem that comes out of the workshop we did. So sensitivity analysis is, um, how the uncertainty in the output of a model can be apportioned to different sources of uncertainty in the model input. So um, this is kind of really interesting in terms of, um, you know, if I want to know how my system is going to respond with respect to changing my inputs. Now, you'll see this very commonly talked about in machine learning in terms of local sensitivity. And this actually would come up a lot in Amazon. So local sensitivity, so in Amazon, um, they used to call this bridging, and I never really worked out to what extent that term bridging is a econometrics term or it was an Amazon specific term. I think it's an econometrics term where you, you uh, uh, sort of linearize around an operating point. So what you do is you look at the, the function you're interested in and you um, differentiate it with respect to an input and you find the gradient of the function at that point, right? Now that's the sort of thing that you, I mean, it's kind of remarkable in machine learning. That's, I can't even remember what's called Lime or something. I mean, it's like the most obvious first way of doing uh, interpretability on your system and has been done for years in other domains, but apparently that's an exciting new area of research in machine learning when you do it to a neural network. Um, but yeah, that's local sensitivity analysis. So um, you're just sort of looking at the operating point of where your inputs are, and then you're trying to look at the gradient around that operating point, and then you're trying to play with that. That's not what we're really going to talk about today, because that's relatively straightforward. I mean, although apparently it's a big area of research and machine learning, I think it's the easier thing than what we're going to talk about, which is a global sensitivity analysis, where you're um, sort of looking across the, the range of inputs. And so we'll we'll go through a bit about what that means. So in a global sensitivity analysis, what we're trying to do is look at the variance in our output, 
So this is our function. Now the user function in the terminology we use for MUKIT, which would be the simulation, is here is G of X. And the range of inputs that we expect to have is given by distribution P of X, right? So there's some sort of range of inputs that we expect to be valid inputs in the real world, which might be, I don't know, in a climate model, they might be a distribution over reasonable carbon outputs or whatever else we're thinking, but that's the inputs of the, set, the setup. And G of X is the function we're interested in, which might be the global temperature rise in you know, uh, three years time. And in global sensitivity analysis, what you're looking to do is look at the integrated range across that set of inputs. So it's not around a particular operating point. The previous example would be sort of for one given X, look at the gradient in that region. Here, you're looking at integrating this thing, which is just the definition of the variance, the statistical variance of the function, and integrating it across P of X, which is your inputs. Now, I'm just putting this here because I like this angle bracket for expectation. Uh, it's a notation for expectation, but a lot of people would use a big fat E. The reason I like this angle bracket is because it's quite, I don't know, I, I think the E is distracting. Um, uh, this is a physics notation actually. Um, and what this, is, what this notation means, the angle brackets is take the expectation of this function under this distribution. So that's just what that's showing you there, right? So that's the definition of expectation. But you may be more used to a funny looking E at the front here. And the odd thing is when you have that funny looking E, you normally don't specify um, what the distributions with respect to. Um, and sometimes we also won't specify that. Sometimes we just use the angle brackets. It's quite widely used in, in statistical physics uh, as a notation. Um, so the input density could be many things, but actually what we'll care about is an input density, which is quite simple. So we just assume an input density, which is independent across all dimensions and is uniform between zero and one. Now, that's general because we could always scale the inputs of our function to make that zero one mapping, whatever mapping we want. So conceptually, we can think just about uniform in each uh, direction and independent in each direction. So this sort of leads to, what does this look like? It just looks like a hypercube with uniform probability across the hypercube, yeah? So that's what we're sort of saying that, that in, in the case that we're gonna look at today, we're just uniformly sampling we just believe the, the inputs are distributed uniformly. That's for simplicity. You, you can vary this totally because in the end, what we're gonna do to do sensitivity analysis is, uh, Siri, is um, what we're going to do to do sensitivity analysis is um, uh, Monte Carlo methods, which just means we'll sample from this distribution. So you can use any distribution for this. Okay, and then the main thing that we, um, are going to make use of is um, what's called the hoofding sobel decomposition. So what the hoofding sobel decomposition does is takes our simulation and says, we can decompose this simulation into the following components. Some G of zero, which is conceptually we can think of as like being a mean, plus some contribution that are from each input. So Xi, each individual Xi here is one of the inputs that might affect our system. So uh, let's try and think of a sort of sensible, simple example to talk about. Um, I don't know if we're doing ice sheet modeling, I guess one of the inputs uh, might be sea surface temperature uh, at the starting point or something like that. Um, another input um, might be coming from an atmospheric model. I don't know, we've got a number of different inputs and here we have P inputs. By the way, I'm using the notation P because that's a statistician's notation. It's quite odd because you would expect that they might want to use P for probability, but they don't. Sometimes they use pi for probability, which is odd because you might think they might be able to use pi to represent 3.1459. I don't know how these things happen, but these things do happen that P is used in statistics to represent dimensionality of the input function. In machine learning, you'll typically hear people using D. Um, I started using P because I felt then I would be taken more seriously by statisticians. 
I don't mind if I'm taken seriously by machine learning people or not. Um, also, you'll hear this sort of concept called the large, large P small N problem, which is uh, statistics when you've got many features and, and few uh, data points. So you, you hear it quite a lot in that language. So here you're sort of saying this overall function, I've got this decomposition where I say it can be decomposed into these parts. The sum of parts is like as functions of single input variables plus a sum of parts, which is a function of two of the input dimensions, right? So this is like cross terms. So what you see this, this function is trying to do is say that given any function, I can decompose it into things that I say, well, that's not a function of the inputs. That's like kind of like a, a mean or an offset. Another part, which is these is how this function is varying with respect to each individual input, adding them together additively. Another part that says, now I'm gonna to add together contributions, which I can view as coming from interaction terms. So interactions between two inputs. So how does like this function vary? What's, what's the interaction term associated with, for example, the um, average humidity in the atmosphere and the sea surface temperature as they feed into what we expect the ice sheet to do? And then of course I can keep going, right? So these terms go up, it gets more and more complicated. Um, that there's, um, so there's quadratic interaction terms between quadratic scaling, right? interaction terms between xi and xj, then there's a cubic number of, so th this is the sort of challenge with this decomposition as I go forward, I start finding that the number of terms I need to consider uh, sort of increases. Right, so what it turns out is if you do a little bit of math, and I think there's more detail either in the notes or in references you get from the notes, that you can work out what these terms are with the following expectations. So as I sort of said, the first one is a bit like a mean. So that turns out to be the nature of, if you wanna work out what that function is, then that function arises from just averaging over P of X of your simulation G of X, yeah? So that first term is like the way you're getting rid so it's sort of interesting. And if you look at these functions here, this is called, in machine learning, we often refer to these integrals, uh, well, we refer to integrals as marginalization, right? Normally when we don't have this function here, we marginalize the variables. Why do we think, I always think, why do we, I, well, I wondered once, why do we call it marginalization? And rather than looking up, I decided that we call things marginalization because the variables disappear from the function, and the only way you would remember them if you, is if you wrote them in the margin. That's why I think we call it that. I don't know. It's a good enough explanation, isn't it? Yeah. Have you ever thought about that? No, no, no. Have I ever said no. that to you before? No, no. Yeah. yeah, that's why we call it marginalization. Absolutely. Yeah, because removing the variables. That is what's going Is it what it says in Wikipedia? And I don't think I wrote that. I have wrote some stuff <laughs> on Wikipedia. <laughs> may have been me, but I haven't edited Wikipedia properly in about 15 years, so you'd have to go a long way back. Oh, that is, by the way, Neil's rule of Wikipedia, by the way. If you want an understandable explanation of something, uh, look at Wikipedia in 2006, <laughs> okay? Because what's happened, the rule of the way Wikipedia works, in about 2006, people were writing articles and they were trying to give explanations that were understandable, but those articles have all been edited to be more correct. And as you edit towards correctness, you lose interpretability. So the articles are now much more correct, but they're quite hard to understand when you first read them because they're covering all, they're, they're working at a, a fine grained fidelity. Whereas the initial articles were, were working at a coarse grained fidelity. So if you do want to understand something on Wikipedia, my uh, Neil's rule of Wikipedia, read it in 2006. It's not universally true because some articles weren't even written up in 2006. So there's some sort of rule around like, read the article within a few years of it first being written. Um, but for me, that sticks as 2006. So yeah, so uh, yeah. So does it say in 2006 is the question, yeah. <laughs> I did edit Wikipedia in 2006, um, probably including the Gaussian process articles, but I haven't touched it in years, um, unless I see a typo. 
Um, right. So, uh, so the, the point about marginalization, the point we're trying to make there is that um, uh, we, when we look at these functions, the reason they're becoming functions of one variable is because we've marginalized the other variables, right? So this first one here, we're marginalizing everything. It's not a function of any variables. So the expectation, that's the easy way to remember why the expectation is gonna look as it does. The expectation we're taking is across all variables. Now, it's not a classical probabilistic marginalization because um, if it were the case, you would just get distribution one, right? If you marginalize everything, you, you just get probability of one, but it's because it's over a function, you get a number out, right? Now, similar, if we want to get these functions of the different individual variables, uh, we've got a marginalization that occurs over all variables apart from that one, yeah? So actually, this is the type of thing Trying to reconstruct that Mark Kennedy must have been doing when he came up with the sensitivity of how those leaves were falling relative sorry how the how the carbon recycle was responding to changing times of the leaves falling he was looking at this function with respect to changing times of the leaves falling while integrating all other variables out from the carbon cycle and that must have been I hadn't really reconstructed that until now that must have been the plot he showed us back in 2001 in Sheffield, which is stuck in my head ever since. Um, but you also have this thing, the way that you're composing this is you then subtract the contribution from the previous component. So this is how you start to construct each of these components. So it's not like, you know, it's a sort of laborious process in some way to construct each one because you have to construct the previous one to get the next one, right? So here, yeah, when we're defining the probability, the prior distribution, over all x apart from xi as precisely the marginalized distribution integrating over xi. So that's integrated out first before integrating over g of x, and then you integrate over the others. So, you know, one of, so it's basically that integral here is of the form integral of um, p of x i. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, easier to write down actually it's got to be integral of um uh p of x i and then another integral over p of x not i of gx uh p of x i so no oh, no the, sorry it's the other way around isn't it the g of x is on the outside and the p of x is on the inside so that's the way that one is formed and then basically you keep going right so here to get this next one you're doing the same thing again. You're integrating over um, x, not i, and not j, yeah? And then subtracting the contribution of xi and xj and g of zero. So it's a sort of recursive definition that gives you these parts. Jonathan. I'm not really sure that this definition checks out because if we follow it, then like gi of xi should just be zero because this integral, when we like, again, taking the expectation over it, we're just gonna get g naught again. No, because you've removed the, you're integrating over everything apart from the xi. Yeah, in that I totally agree, but what's written here is not that. What's oh, wait, which is first? missing? Where have I got the thing? No, no like here this integral, p of x, not i. Yeah. Like there we say. Then I should get left with a function of g of xi, yeah? So here, because I'm marginalizing everything apart from the xi term, so this object here is going to be a function of xi. Does that make sense? Ah, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so this object here, because I'm marginalizing everything apart from xi, that's what I'm trying to, sorry, this, I should have been clear. This notation here is like a not i, right? So it's quite widely used in statistics to sort of say everything apart from the i term, right? So this distribution here is, or maybe I've confused you with this one, haven't I? Yeah, that that's yeah sorry that that sorry yeah that's why i've confused you Jonathan. that this 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 thing's wrong isn't it this should be uh the integral over everything apart from i not of the integral over i yeah sorry yeah um yeah so there's an error there thanks Jonathan. um but not an error here so this thing is a function over x i but it's not quite this because you've got to subtract this g zero this thing here is a function of x i and x j because we've removed two of the indices from there, right? Because we're not in this distribution is not over x i and x j. Um, so this is a function of x i and x j. 
It's also in the notes. So if you if you're not following, just look at it in detail in the notes. And then this is also these two are functions of xi and xj. So we've got something here that's a function of xi and xj. And you just do that for every single set of variables. Now it's quite a tedious process to um, do that, particularly because these integrals themselves are not um, trackable. Yeah, the third one isn't it that it should be like a function of all these? Let's say that one as well. Take all the third. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's fine. One of the things is really important is uncertainty. <laughs> and if I give you a clear answer, you won't sustain your uncertainty about what's going on. Right? Yeah? That's what the course is all about, to be honest. Yeah, yeah no, yeah, you're right. You're right. No, that is right. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's your to messing. Like Bolex on the right hand side is both the Bolex not I and XI capital So, yeah, I think that's Sorry, right. It, it is right. Yeah. Because if you're like me and you know you make errors and things, you immediately assume you made an error. But you're right, I didn't make an error. So it's like this integral here is saying integrate out only the XI term. So you've got a distribution over everything apart from. Xi, right? So that's a margin, that's a marginalized distribution, right? So if let's okay, let's see, let's do an example. If this was just over x1 and x2, right? If there were just two input variables, what we would be getting here is this is p of x1 or p of x2. This thing here is the joint distribution of p of x1 and x2. This thing would either be p of x1 or p of x2. If we were g of g1 of x1 would equal g of x1 comma x2 expectation under p of x2 yeah minus g0 yeah so for you can see it for those two variables there and then this one would say p of x2 is equal to the integral of p of x1 comma x2 under x1 yeah and then that would be p of x2 is equal to the integral of p of x1 comma x2 I've just done the same thing under X2. I can't remember what I've done. Um, and then this thing would be here would just turn out to be G of X1 comma X, G of X2 is equal to uh, this thing basically wouldn't exist. So it would be just G of X1 comma X2 because there's no expectation anymore. There's nothing to integrate over. This thing, the, the P of X, not I, not J is basically a delta function, right? Doesn't even exist. So this would be G of X1 comma X2 minus the G1 of X1 minus the G2 of X2 minus G0. So it would be the residual. You can see this is the residual. It would be the residual of the simulation once I've removed the portion of the simulation as defined here, portion of the simulation as defined here, and the mean of the residual is the residual of what's left, yeah? And that's what the whole thing's doing. Eventually you end up sort of saying, subtract out all the components that you've been looking at so far, and you're just left with a residual of what the simulation is left. And you're doing that at each stage. That's the whole thing, so distribution. Yeah, question. So in this scenario, you are described, how does the first term on the right-hand side add the term on the left? How does this term? Ah, uh, oh, because it's got subtracted the contribution from, yeah, good question. Yeah, nice to think about that. It's it's got subtracted the contribution we've defined as being the single variable decomposition uh, distribution function, the function of the single variable. It's got subtracted for x1 and for x2 in the x1 and x2 case, and then it's also got subtracted the sort of mean value of the function. But like the first term on the right hand side is like also a function of both x i and x j, right? Like, this will be because this, this expectation becomes invalid, right? Because we we not we're not doing any integral on this object here. So this thing has disappeared and it becomes here the x one comma r right. The expectation no, because ah oh, right. I see what I think you're pointing at. Notice the sub index to define the components, right? So it's not so that what I think you're saying. If I'm reverse engineering your question properly, you're saying isn't this the same g equals g? No, because the function of the sub index is a different function than the original function. Yeah. So g of one comma two is not equal to g. But then g is defined from like summing up anything including g one comma two. So I don't know if you sort of like the definition that we say that that is g of x minus two. 
Ah, no, it's actually defined the other way around, isn't it? So it's defined like that. So we're reversing that definition to recover what those components must be. Uh, yeah. So we're defining that's the decomposition. We're defining the subcomponents in the decomposition. And now we're, we're reversing the equation. Like, so G is defined by the user function, right? So that's something that we're given by uh, right. our simulation. And then this is a decomposition that works for any function. Yeah. And then we're trying to say, given that decomposition that works for any function, how do we decompose the part? By the way, there is no exam on this. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the exam I'm getting on it now. <laughs> I think that works, right? Thank you. But that, yeah, it's good. I really actually enjoy the fact that we're discussing it. It's nice. Well, um, one, one thing you can think of where, where you see exactly these kinds of constructions without the distraction is if you've written a gate sample, if you've done a PM, you're, you're doing the one dimensional model, not exactly the thing. Is, is that helps anyone? <laughs> then you're doing exactly that. Okay. So, um, so now what we have is that now we can start looking at the decomposition. Now we've got this whole thing, Sobel composition. What we actually care about is the variance. And so what we look at is the variance of the overall function. So what we're now saying, instead of looking at the function itself, it turns out then we can decompose the variance in the same way because variances are additive, right? So because we've got an additive function, we can now decompose the total variance. So when I say we've got an additive function, this function is additive, right? So the total variance of this object on the left just by definitions of variance, can be decomposed into the variance of each component on the right because it's an additive function. Yeah. So when we come to do the, you got something? Yeah. So, yeah. so I mean that only works if they like they aren't they aren't correlated. And I'm assuming here like simply because we have to redefine this like this decomposition where like each time we subtract the previous term, that's what makes them be uncorrelated one another. Like, yeah. Essentially, we're like subtracting the correlation that the different parts have. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um. So now we have the variance of the overall function can be decomposed into the variance of the individual components, and that's what we mean by global sensitivity analysis. So now we can say which component of these functions is contributing the most. Is it the sea surface temperature? Is it the humidity in the atmosphere? Is it how many times the Sir David Attenborough is driven around the ocean down there or whatever else we're trying to measure? Um, but what we've got is an ability to decompose that into the individual inputs, but also interaction terms, how terms are interacting, what's the importance of the interaction in delivering this, not just what's the importance of one function. By the way, quick question, see if you've got the intuition, what would this decomposition look like for a linear function? It would be just the linear terms. It would just be the first term. Yeah. So if this were a linear function, if G were genuinely linear, all of these things would be zero. If this were a quadratic function, the second term would exist and all the rest of the terms would be zero. If it were a cubic function, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. If it was a quadratic function that had interaction terms, if it was simply like some function that depends only on, say, it's. Yes, term. a quadratic function with interaction terms. So there were, if there was sort of quadratic, a general quadratic function would have non zero, could have non zero. Yeah, that's a stricter way of putting it. Okay, and then so what we do is we represent the Sobel indices because the total variance, so it's a sort of, the total variance is the sum of all these things. And now we want an index. So actually we want to know the relative contribution of each of these things. So the Sobel index is like SL is the variance of each of those individual components divided by the total variance. So basically they sum up to one, right? By doing this, you ensure that the whole sensitivity. So like when you look at one of these Sobel indices, you know you're just looking at some, portion of the contribution. So a little a, a quick example. So this is um, the Ishigami function, which is just a function, I think, I don't, I don't know where, it may even just be originally used to sort of uh, in, for these Sobel indices, where you've got a few different terms in, so you've got sine of x1, a sine squared of x2, and you've got a, bx3 to the 4 
times sine of x1. So what might we expect in terms of several indices for this function? Well, the x2 term will just be zero, s2 will be zero, essentially. Yeah, so what we've got, where would we expect interaction terms? Between x3 and x1. Between x3 and x1. So let's have a see if that, is that what happens? Because in practice, these integrals are quite hard to do. So the problem we're now faced with is that it's nice that we've written all these integrals and done this decomposition, but for general functions, how do we get these integrals? Well, we do Monte Carlo. So in practice, what we do is we do Monte Carlo to try and estimate these things. So this is what we see when we estimate by Monte Carlo. In this case, the reason we can also actually do this integral because um, of the functions we've defined. And what we've got is the true sobel indices for x1 and x2 and the Monte Carlo estimates. So this is like the G1, G2, and G3, right? It's not showing us the interaction terms at the moment. And what it's saying is X3 doesn't have uh, a single term. Why is that when we look at that function? I think it's because you've got, it's there as an odd function because this is an even function times an odd function. Yeah, so it's sort of uh, canceling itself out when you look at the, we must, the, the range is, sorry, in this case, the range is minus three to three. But then accordingly, then the x1 would need to be zero because also the sign of x1 is a non function. Well, I'm sure it is. Exactly. Because <laughs> it's coming out. So then we see um, the total effects um, are not the same. So the total effects in the Ishigami is what happens actually if we say, so that's not the only effect from that function, right? because um, the effect, that function is coming in in multiple places, right? So that function is coming in in interaction terms as well. So the total effect of a variable, these things don't sum to one. So notice these do not sum to one. Here they won't sum to one because we're missing the interaction, 0. 0.4 plus 0. 0.3. So we know that there's a missing term here. There's a 0. 0.3 missing term, which is coming from the interaction, right? But there's another term, another interesting thing, don't, that's not the only effect of X3. X3 still has an effect, but X3 only has an effect as an interaction. So what we're actually seeing is the total effect of X3 is 0.3, which is coming from its interaction term, right? And the total effect of X2 is 0.3, and the total effect of X1 is 0.7. Now notice that these things are no longer summing to one because some of these effects are occurring in an interaction. Right now, what you're going to do in the lab class is go a bit beyond that. And what's the whole issue of emulation here? Well, the Ishigami function, fine. We can simulate that. We can do Monte Carlo on it. It's very, very fast. What we do when we do statistical emulation is imagine if we're doing a climate model. So in order to do Monte Carlo estimation, you're having to sample many, many values from this probability distribution and operate the function to do that. So if that's a climate simulation, that's computationally very, very expensive. So what we do is we do the Monte Carlo on the Gaussian process instead of the Monte Carlo directly on the simulation. So the idea is you fit the Gaussian process and you probably use integrated variance reduction that we found out about last time in order to get your Gaussian process fit accurate. And then you do the Monte Carlo estimate on the Gaussian process not on the function, on the user function itself. So instead of running your ice sheet simulation or running your um, uh, climate simulation or your carbon cycle simulation, you just go ahead and do the uh, integration using your Gaussian process surrogate instead. And what you're seeing here, and you'll be recreating all this in the lab, is the uh, first order Sobel indices for the Ishigami function where we've done precisely that. So you see that the, I mean, this is the truth, orange, we're getting some approximation from Monte Carlo, and then when we do with the Gaussian process, there's some further approximation going on because we're actually not doing Monte Carlo on the original function, we're doing Monte Carlo on the surrogate. And that's a really, really common technique. You'll find in climate modeling and all over the place to just go and do Monte Carlo to fit a surrogate and do Monte Carlo on the surrogate just to try and get sensitivity analysis. So that's, in some sense, there's not really anything very interesting analytic happening because it's all being done through Monte Carlo. Okay. You can also get variance on this. So because, so I haven't shown these here, 
that you can get the variance of this estimate here, because of course, when you do the Gaussian process, you're estimating not just the mean function of your prediction, you have a variance according to how well your function is predicted. And in order to get the variance of this Monte Carlo estimate, you'll basically end up summing those variances and dividing um, by the total number. So you've got Sobel indices are a tool for explaining the variance of output as, sorry, there should be listing M there, components of input variables, but it's a global sensitivity analysis rather than a local. So we can always look at any function and just say, oh, if we've got this, you know, we can think of sensitivity locally by just looking at the gradient. So if, you, if you're standing on a landscape and you're on a hill, you know, how, how your sort of height on the landscape varies is just given by the so-called Jacobian, which is just the gradient in each direction of where you're standing. That's local sensitivity. But if you're looking at global sensitivity, we've defined this sort of variance over the entire landscape. So you're sort of integrating across the entire mountain um, and how that varies and trying to decompose the variation in that function into different components that are coming from the different inputs in that landscape. And that's what the Sobel indices give us. So in the, um, in the lab class, you, you've got this uh, simulation. I still have to check. I don't know if we're setting this. You haven't finished your previous lab class yet, have you? So I don't think this is the best lab class to set as a task because it's just a bit boring, really. Um, so maybe we'll set the next one. So we haven't set the second lab class, the second assignment yet, um, but I'll, uh, I will set the second assignment uh, soon. So I don't think it should be this lab class. But in this lab class, what you get is you just go through that and then you get to play with this catapult simulator that was written by Nicola Giran. Nicola was a postdoc uh, in my group in Sheffield, but before he was a postdoc in my group, he was a postdoc with Tony O'Hagan, who's one of the masters of this domain. And he then also worked in France as an academic where he was teaching these sort of things regularly. And as part of his teaching, he built this little simulator of a catapult um, and what you can do is you've got the, it's got four parameters and those parameters are where the rotation axis is set, the two locations of where the catapult spring is fixed and where this stop is set. So what happens when you run the catapult is it goes up to this position and then the ball goes flying off, right? And then you can simulate with or without wind and what your task in the lab class, so you can sort of put breezy or windy or no wind. Um, what your task is in the lab class is to do a sensitivity analysis on which of those four inputs is determining the range of the catapult, right? So that's a sort of, you, you play with that and you basically can fit a, what you do is uh, you start with an initial uh, uh, design of experiments that is model free. So you get uh, your model free design, then you do integrated, you can do integrated variance reduction. You can also do, I think it suggests you also do uncertainty sampling and you'll see the difference between uncertainty sampling and integrated variance reduction. The only thing I remember about the lab class, and I don't understand why it's really slow on collab when you do the integrated variance reduction. So just be aware of that. But yeah, so here in this case, that's what your X is made up of. Um, and what you're going to do is build an experimental design loop, start with your model free design, and you can do random design, Latin hypercube sampling, sobel sequences, or orthogonal design to build up your initial estimate of what the catapult function looks like. And then, uh, yeah, so actually we're suggesting to start with integrated variance reduction and then try afterwards with uncertainty sampling as, and you know, you'll just see the difference. I mean, what you'll basically find is uncertainty sampling is pretty useless because it keeps on sampling for you near the boundaries, which turn out to be places you don't really care about. What you will find, as I say, that the integrated variance reduction is a little bit um, uh, slow on collab, but not slow on your regular machine. So th this, is, this is like the results I, I've got by doing that. So what I found was that the, uh, it was highly sensitive to the arm stop position which actually fits with my understanding of how catapults work because the arm stop is that thing there. And I think the optimal trajectory is something like if the arm stopping at 45 degrees or something like that. I mean, it's a simple simulation. So 
So you're seeing if you don't have, so this stop is going low enough that basically at this point here, the catapult's firing up in the air. And at that point there, the catapult's firing it too far forward. So that's kind of fits with my rough intuition that the, um, that the uh, oh, oh, what have I done? Dev tools. What's new in dev tools? Cool. Uh -huh. That fits with my intuition that um, uh, that the, uh, the, the ah, that's what I was doing before uh, about what the results come out as. Okay. Right. So we've got lots of time for questions this week. So questions about that sensitivity analysis or anything else on the call so far. So, uh, when you, oh, you said there's a really high, a fixed high rate, say one start, point, two start, three, two start, three, four. So, so 